All right, well, good morning, and thank you um, for everyone that's been able to join us this morning. Um, my name is Dr. Jenny Ono, and I'm the director of the Wild Cornell Pediatric Asthma Program. Um, thanks, Judy Stribling and the Myra Mahone Patient Resource Center for inviting us today. Um, what we were hoping to do is um, give some um, practical advice to our parents and care caregivers of children with asthma about getting back to school um, safely and setting them up for a successful school year. I'm very happy to introduce our speakers this morning. Um, Dr. Callie Sirlakis is a pediatric pulmonologist um, and asthma specialist. She sees patients at both our Wild Cornell and New York Presbyterian Queens campuses, um, and she is the director of pediatric pulmonology and the asthma center at New York Presbyterian Queens. Um, Katiana Garagozolo is our uh, pediatrician and our um, pediatric uh, pulmonology fellow. And Susan McCulloch is uh, asthma programs dedicated certified asthma educator. Um, and we hope that you find the session useful and helpful. And we will certainly leave um, plenty of time at the end of the session to have further discussion and to answer any questions that you might have. Um, and with that, I will um, turn it over to Dr. Sirilakis. Kelly, are you able to? I'm trying to, to see the screen. Request <laughs> control. Hold on just a second. <laughs> Christina, did that work? Yes, it's just waiting for you to take control. You can control. Okay, now I can control it. There we go. Mm -hmm. Are we moving? Okay, there we go. Good morning, everybody. Hi there. Sorry for that little bit of delay. So I am uh, Dr. Kelly Tsirilakis, as Dr. Ono mentioned, and I am a pediatric pulmonologist and asthma specialist. I wanted to give you all a little bit of a background um, on asthma and why we are having this conversation today. Um, as many of you know, asthma is quite prevalent in the United States. It is estimated that about uh, 25 million people in the United States actually have asthma and more than 5 million of those uh, uh, individuals with asthma are children under the age of 18. Asthma has uh, a, quite an effect on our healthcare system um, with uh, more than 1.6 million ER visits per year for asthma as of the 2019 data that was available through the CDC. Um, there are also over 170 admissions, uh, 170,000 hospital admissions uh, nationwide for asthma attacks. And 44% of kids with asthma had an exacerbation or an acute attack in 2019. So that's almost half of the kids who have um, asthma uh, diagnosed will actually have an asthma attack in any given year which is uh, quite a big number. Uh, I don't know if I am moving. There we go. Um, okay. I think that there is an, okay. All right. So um, this is a map of the United States showing the prevalence of asthma in kids. So under the age of 18. Um, states that are colored red have the highest prevalence. Um, and you can see New York is red there because our prevalence is that 10% of children in, the, in uh, New York state have asthma, are diagnosed with asthma. There are many other states that have um, much, much lower rates of asthma um, down to uh, uh, in the 4% range. So this is uh, quite a problem for us here in New York state. And this is why this, we need to have these conversations. Um, the thing that you'll also notice is that 10% of kids in New York State have asthma, but the emergency room visits for asthma exacerbations in the United States is much, much more heavily weighted towards kids. So older folks with asthma tend to really manage their asthma at home, and they really do not require as much emergency room um, uh, care for their asthma exacerbation. So you can see here in the middle, the three bars in the middle, um, which this represents all children. And then these are younger children, zero to four, and then uh, children ages five to 17 years of age. 
the rates of children requiring emergency room visits for those age groups are much, much higher than they are for adults. In New York State, um, as we mentioned, one in 10 kids does have asthma. Of those uh, New York State children, 70,000 New York City public school kids, not even including high schoolers, have asthma. This is why we're having this conversation today because our New York City schools are very used to seeing asthma. And this is an important message that we pass along to all of our patients with asthma is that they are not alone. Um, the school nurses all know about asthma. Their teachers know about asthma. There are multiple children in all schools in New York that have asthma. And so parents and children should not feel that they are singled out because they do have this chronic illness. In New York State, there are about 65,000 emergency room visits for asthma every year and 11,000 admissions to the hospital for asthma. This leads to about $660 million of, uh, of uh, cost for the asthma hospitalizations and for school uh, lost school days and missed work and all of the other factors that go into asthma care. It is thought that um, asthma care costs New York State about $1.3 billion per year, which is a large number. So we really, really wanna try to get to the crux of the problem and helping our patients to manage their asthma at home and to really help the schools keep the, uh, help kids keep their asthma under good control. So this is just a little bit of an explanation for, um, for some of you who have not seen this before as to why these asthma attacks are happening. So as we know, there are genetic factors as well as environmental risk factors that will lead to the development of asthma in a, in a child. This uh, asthma leads to chronic inflammation or inflammation or irritation that's inside the child's lungs at all times. And then when you have risk factors for those exacerbations, which we're gonna talk about today, things like triggers, what you end up with is these very reactive airways so that they get very tight. So this is the uh, an air, uh, picture of an airway inside the lungs. And so you have the muscles tightening up and then you have all of this mucus production and this inflammation or irritation within the airways that leads to a blockage of that airflow or what we call obstruction, which leads to what we call asthma symptoms. Um, so those would be things like coughing or wheezing or difficulty breathing. So when a child, like we said, those 44,000 kids who have, 44% uh, of kids who have an asthma attack in any given year, when they present at school to their school nurse, the school nurse really needs to know what to do and needs to know that that child has asthma. So this is why it's so incredibly important to open up those lines of communication with your school nurse and with your child's teachers to make sure that they are aware of your child's diagnoses and what their plan for uh, an asthma exacerbation would be in case they do have any problems at school. New York City um, Department of Health has a program called the Open Airways in Schools, um, which all uh, New York City public uh, school nurses have uh, been educated on asthma and asthma management. And this is also available to you so that you can speak to your school nurses about educating your children about how to help manage their asthma while they are in school. If anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to take them at the end of the talk. I'm gonna pass on to our next speaker. All right. Thank you so much, Callie. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Katiana. I'm a pediatric pulmonology fellow at Weill Cornell, and I'm just going to be taking a brief moment to talk to you about things that could make your child's asthma worse and knowing their triggers. So when your child goes back to school, there's going to be a bunch of things there that could potentially trigger their asthma. Um, and so in the figure on the right, you can see there's a couple of examples. Um, one of the most common triggers for childhood asthma is colds and infections. Um, so viruses and things like that, you know, 
washing your hands is really important in order to prevent um, your child from being triggered. Um, some other things that could trigger your child's asthma is like food allergies. So again, having very good lines of communication with your school is important. So say your child has a peanut allergy or some other food allergy, you need to have your school nurse be aware so that they can mitigate the exposure to this, this type of trigger. Um, maybe your child is uh, triggered by exercise or playing really hard um, and these kinds of things, you're, again, your nursing staff at your school has to be aware of so that they have a plan in place so that before your child goes out to play, they maybe need to take their pump um, to kind of protect, potentially pr protect them from having a severe asthma exacerbation. Some other things that could be you know, triggering for patients are strong smells, certain cleaning supplies, pollution, smoke, mold, pests, and these things, uh, you know, just to be aware of that if your child is triggered by these, uh, these exposures, just making your school aware. Um, another couple of ones that are important to point out for school is um, different animals, pollen, weather changes, you know, um, if there's any like school, school pets, you know, making sure the school is aware that maybe your child should be kept away from those things as to, to avoid any sort of exacerbation. And then with pollen and weather changes, you know, when if your child has seasonal allergies, things like that, it's important to talk to your primary care provider or your subspecialty provider on the best things to mitigate and control your uh, your chance of having an exacerbation from pollen or um, weather changes. And also dust is another really important one to keep in mind. So for me, the three biggest tips I can give to my patients to uh, protect themselves when they go back to school is number one, avoiding exposure to any sort of known triggers to your child. So like that list there. So communicating that those things to your school nurses is really important. Uh, the second tip I have is washing your hands frequently with soap for 20 seconds. And if it's hard to you know how, know how long 20 seconds is. I tell my littler patients just to hum the happy birthday song two times in their head and that is gonna really help reduce transmission of viruses and cold, you know, the common cold in the schools. And also it, using hand sanitizer in between during the day is also a really good tip. The third thing, which is also, you know, probably one of the most important is wearing your mask. We've seen in this last, you know, couple of months with the pandemic is that wearing masks and good hand hygiene have really have been the cornerstones of protection against transmission of, of viruses such as flu and COVID-19, as well as your other garden variety viruses. So in school, it really is in the best interest of your child to wear a mask, especially if they have asthma and are triggered by colds and infections, this will really help reduce any chance of having a, a severe asthma exacerbation. And so then kind of going hand in hand with mask wearing is vaccination. You know, a lot of these viruses have vaccines available and you know any death or injury from a vaccine preventable disease is really a tragedy in pediatrics you know a pre-pandemic influenza would kill up to 200 children a year and you know this is again a vaccine preventable illness so first and foremost your children should get vaccinated for the influenza virus it is soon to be it is commercially available and everyone should be vaccinated against flu ideally by september and october um, this will prevent your child from getting really sick uh, from influenza and also from having a severe exacerbation secondary to uh, influenza virus. And then kind of piggybacking off of that, you know, the COVID-19 vaccine is available and FDA approved for children above the age of 12. Um, and the CDC highly recommends anyone to get protected. And it'll not only protect your child from getting sick, but also prevent your child from infecting other children, their teachers, their school. And, um, you know, it is just really like to highlight that it is really important that we get vaccinated if you're eligible against the COVID-19 uh, COVID virus. And with that, I will kind of pass it off to Susan. Oh goodness, did I do that? <laughs> yep. All right, I'm sorry.
Okay. Hi, I'm Susan. I'm the asthma educator at New York Presbyterian Wild Cornell Pediatric Practice. I um, am going to go over some forms today. My role as an asthma educator is to teach you and your child to um, how to achieve good asthma control. With these forms that I'm going to go over, it's the way that your child will succeed at school. They'll go to school feeling well, and if they're sick, they'll get help and they can achieve success at school by keeping their asthma under control. This is the asthma action plan. It's a written plan made by you and your doctor um, that explains how to keep your child's asthma under control. It's like a stoplight. You can see green, green means go. Your child's feeling well, they have no symptoms and they're taking the medications under this. <clears throat> The bottom part of the green area is for exercise-induced asthma. If your child has exercise-induced asthma, they need to take their medication prior to going to gym or even recess. <clears throat> um, the yellow zone is maybe your child's not feeling well. You need to explain to um, the teachers the after school people, and if they play sports, all these people should have this plan. And in the yellow zone, if your child's not feeling well, you can tell them what symptoms your child has. It could be a cough, it could be a runny nose, it could be a wheeze. In younger children, sometimes it's just that your child's not feeling well and they get quieter. So whatever the symptoms are, you need to explain to everybody that's going to be taking care of your child when they're not feeling well, what are the signs and symptoms to do? And then they know to give the medicine. And then in the red zone, they need to know that if they're not getting better and you've given additional puffs, that you need to get help emergently. Okay. The Next form is a very important form that the school needs to have. They need to have this form in order to treat your child. So we're going to go through this carefully. Not only for you, but for your child, this form um, gives a lot of information to the school. It talks about their control, what kind of asthma they have, what symptoms they've been having in a while, and um, what medicines to give. So in this quick relief school medication area, there's things to be checked off, albuterol. Ask your, um, when you're handing this form in, it's important to hand it in and go to the nurse and give it to her or, or him. You need to get the nurse phone number. You need to give the nurse your phone number. On the back of this form where you sign it, your phone number and emergency contacts will all be listed there. Make sure they're correct. And if they get changed, make sure that um, the, the nurse is up to date on it. So albuterol, they should have that at school. There's stock medicine or the parent has to provide. Talk to the school nurse and see what they, they need you to do. Um, Every child should use a spacer at school, so they should also be provided with a spacer, and we will check that off for your child as well. Um, Pre-exercise. 80% of children that have asthma have exercise-induced bronchoconstriction or exercise-induced asthma. They need to take some medication before gym. If they don't, they're gonna to have to stop and they're not gonna be participating in gym and you know we don't want that for your children. One of the new checks is this URI symptoms. So two puffs given, so very important. If you in the morning, your child wakes up and oh, coughing, not feeling well, but well enough to go to school, you give your child two puffs. It's important to call the school nurse and say, I gave my child albuterol. I don't think he's feeling well. Can you check him at noon and see if he needs more pups? Again, if your child's going to after school, you need to make sure that the after school people know if, if it's four o'clock now, somebody needs to see if, if your child needs two more pups. 
So now instead of going to school and coming home from school at like five or 6 p.m., your child's going to have the appropriate medicine given and then you're able to assess again at the next four hour mark. And this will help achieve success in the asthma control. One of the other things that the schools have, and you can talk to your um, school nurse about it, is a program where they give the controller med at school. In the morning, if you have, uh, have trouble in the morning getting your child out to school, if you're up early and they're taking a bus and they forget to take the, the controller medicine often, it's important to maybe talk to the nurse about giving it in school those five days that they're going to school. And we can fill that part out for you as well. I left one important part out and it's the student skill level. Of course, a younger child is, um, of course, a younger child is um, not able to do it themselves, but they go to the nurse and the nurse is um, helping them give the medicine. Another part is the supervised students. So maybe a child's not ready, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes, not ready to carry their own medication and be independent, but that the nurse can help them they go to the nurse, they do it themselves, and the nurse coaches them. And then the last part is the independent student where they can self-carry. And we're going to go through a few things that we need before we check that box off. So the next slide is the use of the spacer. And I said that every child that we, um, every, every child should use a spacer with their albuterol or with their MDI. Um, if you do puff puff in your mouth, the medicine, the, the force that you press, the medicine shoots into the mouth, back of the throat, and, and not much medicine gets into the lung. It actually goes to the stomach. If you use a spacer, it slows down the force and matches with the breath and more medicine gets into the lung. Every person that uses, um, uses a pump with um, that has a propellant and the and the the HFA, you know. I'm sorry. Um, they will be using a spacer. All right. Now, ready to carry. The next slide um, is important. Most kids starting at seven can be taught about the basic understanding of asthma. That doesn't mean that they can carry their own spacer. There's a lot of questions that go into carrying a spacer. Are they going to, do they understand their symptoms? Can they say, oh, I'm not feeling well, um, I, I should take my albuterol? Do they understand when they don't feel well and they take their albuterol that they need to tell somebody? They need to tell the teacher or who they're with that I'm taking my albuterol, I'm not feeling that well, so somebody else knows. Um, will they take it properly? Do they know that they're not just taking it to uh, maybe show off in school? Maybe they um, don't really understand their symptoms and they're just taking it too much. So these are all things that we assess and, um, and we decide if they're ready to self-carry. We do demonstrations. The children demonstrate, we teach, and we do a teach back method can they do the basics of taking their medicine by themselves? All right. So I'm going to speak to um, a little bit about what, uh, so we have this um, checklist that we have put together, which we can make available to uh, providers that are out there or to patients who would request it. We can uh, ask uh, Judy to post this on, on the website um, where you really should be going through all of this with your school nurse and with uh, your child's teacher to make sure that you have all of these things available to your child at school. And it's all the things that we talked about. So really making sure that, they, that your child has that asthma action plan 
and their medications that they need and that you've discussed this medication administration form with the school nurse and also their teacher. In some cases, you might also need to talk to their gym teacher specifically because the gym teacher, if the child is using asthma medication prior to exercise, their gym teacher is gonna be really integral to identifying when that child is still having symptoms. Um, so as we talked about, really talking and keeping uh, open those lines of communication are incredibly important. Make sure you know how to contact the school nurse, make sure that the school nurse knows how to contact you um, at any time because they might need to call you in the middle of the school day because your child is having an exacerbation. We also need to make sure that you're able to identify what those triggers are and that you talk to the school nurse and the, and the teacher about making sure that your child is avoiding any of those things in school. Finally, like we talked about, um, we wanna make sure that you're doing all of the things that you can to really help prevent those uh, viral illnesses and those uh, other uh, infectious triggers of asthma attacks uh, with good uh, wearing a face mask, good hand washing and vaccinations for all appropriate illnesses as needed. Um, if you have any questions about any of this, we'll be happy to take them at this time. And uh, the way you can submit your questions is through the chat box. So um, please feel free to do that. And I will uh, direct the question to who uh, may be better to answer it. While we're waiting, I, um, I did have um, a couple questions that um, just that had come up in some conversations with some families um, in clinic. Um, the, um, what are some of your advice as far as um, it, when the weather gets cold, um, waiting for school buses or waiting in line? So now that children, a lot of children are not going directly to school, they're gathering outside of the school um, and waiting before they go in. Um, for children that have difficulty um, uh, with weather changes and cool air, what do you guys recommend as far as preventing um, asthma symptoms when they're having to stand waiting for the bus or stand waiting um, to get in line to go to school? So this is actually a, another place where masks are really coming in handy for kids with asthma in particular. So um, I've had uh, several parents uh, ask me whether their child should not be wearing a mask because they have asthma. And it's actually the opposite. Because they have asthma, they should be wearing a mask. And that counts indoors and even outdoors because one of the ways that you help to reduce asthma exacerbations or triggers from cold air is to warm up that air. So prior to the days of kids walking around wearing masks, we used to recommend that our asthma patients actually wrap a scarf around their uh, nose and mouth or that they use something like those turtle furs um, or the um, basically the, the neck, uh, the neck scarves to cover their nose and mouth so that they are breathing in a warmed up air so that it is not as cold um, when they do need to stand outside. Similarly, when they're wearing their masks inside, those masks are not just warming up the air, but they're actually keeping out all of the other viruses so that they are protecting children from other viruses and, and allergens as well. So even in the springtime or in the fall, if your child has a lot of uh, pollen allergies um, or airborne allergies, then you want them to be wearing a mask even when they're outside because that will act as a filter so that they are not getting exposed to as much of the things that, they, that will trigger their asthma, whether it's allergies or viruses or cold air. It's a great question. We also have some kids that walk pretty far to school, and if they're late, they're going to be walking pretty fast and far. So um, if parent approaches me and tells me that that's causing a lot of trouble, we tell them to take their albuterol two puffs before they, 15 min, 10 to 15 minutes before they leave. We count that as exercise. Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And Susan, what are some of the, um, now that, you know, there's obviously a lot of um, general worry about sending um, kids back to school in general, but um, what are some of the um, questions and concerns that you're hearing from your families that you've been working with in clinic um, around going back to school? Um, 
you know, a lot of parents during the pandemic never sent their kids back to school because of the asthma. And um, they were able to do remote learning this year, of course, they're not. So a lot of parents are worried and concerned. The main thing is also that my job is to teach them good asthma control. And, you know, all these things that we're discussing is what we tell the parents, wear the mace, face mask, wash the hands often, um, alert the, the, the school, um, make sure they have the forms. Your job as a parent is to help communicate between us and school to keep your child's asthma under good control. And if your child's under good control, that they're going to do fine at, at, at school. One of the things that we know is that um, although we don't know 100% uh, the effects of COVID with asthma, we have seen that um, there has been a significant decrease in asthma exacerbations through the pandemic. Now that is for multiple different reasons, um, including the fact that everybody has been staying home and there have been less viruses in general. Um, so in addition to those other um, uh, infection control um, practices that we are all using, such as wearing masks and good hand washing, um, we cannot stress the importance of good asthma control um, enough. And what that means is if your child is on a controller medication, which some children with asthma are, um, such as an inhaled uh, steroid inhaler, um, it is incredibly important that they adhere, that they use that medication as directed by their physicians, because that is what is going to help keep them under good control so that if they do um, uh, get COVID or they do get a different viral illness, they will be less likely to have a severe exacerbation and they will be less likely to get very sick um, and that we will be able to get them through that viral illness, whether it's COVID or something else, um, without needing to go to the hospital or get admitted or go to the emergency room. I have another question. What should um, parents be telling their children um, about when, if they go to school and they're not feeling well, um, how, what, what would the message be that when you talk to parents about, and, and the patients, um, sort of what they should do when they're in the middle of a school day um, and they're not feeling well because of their asthma? Katiana, you want to take that one? Yeah, I mean, they, they just need to be communicating with the, the nurses, you know, and I think it just harkens back to like this message we're saying is that like having really big open lines of communication is key and having an asthma action plan in place so that, you know, if the child's not feeling well, it's, there's no question of what to do, how to manage it. Everyone has their own special plan, for, you know, catered to each child and what to do when they're not feeling well and you know who to call when you know things are getting you know bad so I think it's just again like having really good communication with your nursing staff and having a really solid asthma action plan. Right. So you want to make sure that the children know that that they should go to their nurse. They need to go to the school nurse. So younger children should be uh, going to the school nurse if they're able to identify that they're having symptoms. But in addition, older children, even older kids who self-carry and self-administer their medicines, they need to know that if they're not feeling well or their medication is not working, they need to go to the nurse. Um, just because they are carrying their medicine around doesn't mean that they have to take care of their asthma themselves if they're really not feeling well. I think that's all we have for now. Judy, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. And if anybody has any other questions, you can also contact us. I really wanna thank uh, the asthma team for putting this together. I think it was a wonderful program and I think exceptionally well-timed since um, kids are going back to school now. And I appreciate your doing this. And you can look for this. Um, I'm going to try to get it up on the Myra Mayan um, 
Patient Resource Center YouTube as soon as possible. So thank, thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it. And have a great day. Thank you, guys. Have a great day. Bye-bye.